And before we get underway, I do want to give a shout out to this month's sponsor, Ingram Spark. So Ingram Spark sponsors my free newsletter in these sessions. I have used Ingram Spark myself for self-publishing distribution. Recently, uh, this year, they, they dropped all of the setup fees for books. It used to cost about 50 or 60 bucks for distribution through Ingram Spark. Now it costs zero. So if you haven't taken a look at Ingram Spark lately, they have made some improvements. They have a better sales dashboard. Um, you can find out more at ingramspark.com, ideal for self-publishing authors. Okay, so the way these free sessions run is they are recorded. So if you miss anything, you can go to my YouTube channel and catch, catch up. Uh, there's the chat for informal back and forth, and there's the Q&A box uh, for questions that you would like me to answer. So usually, depending on attendance, I'm able to get to most of the questions. I hope that will be the case today. So the way we're going to move through this topic is I'm segmenting in, segmenting this topic into different types of scams based on whether they're a publisher, an agent, a marketer, or a publicist. We're also going to talk about contests. And I do have a case study that we're going to do at the end. Um, there was someone who asked me recently, well, I'm asked every week about is such and such a scam. And so I'm I was uh, notified recently of a new one, a new site I hadn't heard of. I wasn't sure if it was a scam or not. So we're going to go step by step through that one. And you can kind of hear how I hear, see, assess um, how I look at these companies. And hopefully that'll help you do the same uh, for companies that I don't know about because I, I can't stay on top of the number of scams that are out there or the number of legitimate services, either one. All right, so publishers first. If you're seeking a traditional publisher, then the number one red flag is they start asking you for money. So do you have to pay to publish? A traditional publisher isn't going to ask you to pay anything up front. They're not going to ask you for a commitment to buy books. I think this is generally well known among people who've been around uh, as an author and submitting. It's one of the first things that you learn. But another thing to keep in mind is, can you negotiate the contract? So for example, I've seen a lot of outfits, and this would probably fall into the bucket of possibly a bad deal, where they hand you a book contract and they say, it's take it or leave it, you can't change anything. So this is less than ideal, and often I would consider walking away at that point because every contract, at least in book publishing, needs to be negotiable. Otherwise, you're really looking more like, like at a terms of service, you know, um, so book contracts, you know, the advance should be negotiable, the royalties should be negotiable, you know, there may be a limit to how far they can go, or the advance may in fact be a take it or leave it, but there should be other areas that you can negotiate to make it the best possible deal for you. What I find is that really small publishers that maybe they've hired a lawyer or they've, they've um, lifted a boilerplate contract from some sort of site and they're afraid to change it, or they don't know how to change it, or maybe they have to hire a lawyer, um, or they feel like they need to hire a lawyer to change it. So I find people with a lot of inexperience in the industry are totally unwilling uh, to modify the contract that they send you. So I, you know, obviously, there are so many things in publishing that are contextual. It's hard to have black and white answers on these things, but I do think that it's probably not a great publisher if they're not at all willing to change a word of what they're sending you. I do have a blog post at my site, uh, questions to ask your publisher before you sign the contract. Uh, if someone wants to look that up and link to it in the chat, I'd be very grateful. Um, that's a really good series of questions or issues to go through with your publisher before you sign on the dotted line. Okay, so Google search results, I think, are one of the worst places uh, for writers because often, uh, at least for general searches, you're going to find that there are ads or sponsored listings at the top that just go to outright scams. It's really bad. Um, and even worse than that, you will find that there are people who have done a really great job at claiming the organic search results at the very top. And so sometimes those can be a little bit suspicious or they can also be scams. 
Um, so you have to be really careful if you're doing any sort of publisher, agent, marketer research on Google. Um, now here I'm going to focus on publishers. Um, so for instance, I just typed in publish book. Uh, there are lots of different variations of this search. You tend to come up with the same sponsored results at the top. And I clicked on every single sponsored link here to investigate what was there. And three out of the four were totally like, do not engage with this company ever. Really bad, really bad. <laughs> I, can't, I can't emphasize how bad. So one of them I'll show you quickly uh, is I think the Amazon professional publishers.com. It's that second result that you see, or maybe it's the fourth one. Ultimately, it's actually the same company. Um, and Victoria Strauss at Writer Beware recently did a really great post rounding up kind of all of the different scams that are being run under the name of Amazon. Makes you wonder why Amazon doesn't like file some sort of cease and desist, but maybe they are. So let's say you clicked on one of those results. Um, you would get basically a, a very information light website with a lot of prompts to give them your email address. That's usually a red flag when all you, you're just railroaded into giving up your personal information, whether that's email, phone number, whatever. Um, so when you do reach one of these sites, if there is a hard sell, you know, don't fall victim to it. At the very least, click on about us or staff and see, are there any real people that appear to be associated with this company? Because good companies, whether they are a services firm or a traditional publisher, they typically have some information about who works there. Real names, real people. Um, one of these sponsored links went to a site that just bombarded me with pop-ups and calls to give away my email address and to activate this offer and, oh, there are only four coupons left. You know, they make, they make it sound like um, if you don't act right away, you're going to lose some great opportunity, which is never the case. And there might be one of those really annoying automated chat bots uh, that pop up in the lower right hand corner. That's another not so good sign that, that you're in. Uh, you're in a bad services or publisher situation. Now, if you just, you know, look at what's on the site, you're going to start seeing all sorts of red flags, um, like guaranteed enlistment in the Amazon top seller list. No publisher can guarantee that. Um, there's a bunch of logos of you know, major book companies or booksellers um, to try and make you think like they're legitimate or they have some credibility. They also just outright lie and include logos of, of places that have nothing to do with them, like the Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Not, no, there is no relationship there. So they will like really, they will lift... Um, author photos and testimonials, maybe authors you know and have heard of, and they will put them on their site. This has happened to me. I've had my name and uh, or likeness used on some of these sites, and it's really hard to get it taken off. So you have to be super cautious and really verify um, that those partnerships or those logos have actually consented to be listed. But usually there are enough other contextual clues and red flags um, that you know you can probably reasonably conclude that a lot of this is just uh, falsehoods one, one after another. So as I've mentioned, a lot of these sites, their only goal really is to either get your email address or your phone number, and then they're going to pummel you with solicitations. Um, so what, here's a classic example, findpublishinghelp.com. It's basically nothing but give us your email address uh, couched in a, a friendly looking questionnaire about what you write and how far along you are and all sorts of other questions like that. Ah, Steffi uh, put the link in the chat to the questions. Thank you very much, Steffi, appreciate that. Now, let me switch to the other side of this. Uh, clues that the company you're assessing might be okay. And this is especially with publishing services, like if you're thinking about using a hybrid publisher, some sort of assistance to get your book published. 
it's really best if they have a bricks and mortar address clearly listed somewhere. You want to see unique content on the site. It would be great if there were an active blog or a newsletter or a social media presence. So you can go and take a look at this company in action and see that there are actually real people associated with it. Um, if you go, for instance, to Mascot Books uh, about page, you're going to find a list of their key staff, their founder, a picture, a name. If you, you know, dig even deeper than that, you'll find that this company really has been around for 20 years, established in 2003. So Mascot Books is, is um, a a publishing service company, I think they might call themselves a hybrid, but I don't differentiate much between the two. And they have a decent reputation. And so if you go and look at your at that particular site, I think you'll find that it just looks so much more legitimate um, than some of the earlier websites that I showed you. Now, there is, of course, so many gray areas um, and what some people consider a scam other people might not. Um, you know, there, there are lots of internet arguments about particular sorts of hybrid publishers, for example, it brings out very strong opinions from people. Um, so an example of one of these is Atmosphere Press, and Atmosphere does a ton of advertising. Um, like if, for instance, if you subscribe to Poets and Writers, um, I know that they advertise frequently uh, in the Poets and Writers newsletter. I think they also advertise with Writer's Digest. And so this leads to a lot of questions from people about whether or not they're a scam or if they're legitimate, et cetera. And Atmosphere has been around for, for some years now. I don't know when they were established, but it, they're not the new kid on the block and there is a person associated with it. Um, but they just engage in some practices that, don't, that, you know, it raises an eyebrow. So like Victoria Strauss has written frequently, look, Atmosphere, they charge a lot of money and they do affiliate marketing or they give kickbacks uh, to people who recommend them. And that's generally a discredited practice in the writing and publishing community. Um, one thing that Atmosphere does that I really don't like, which I'm gonna get to in the next slide is that they're just very raw, raw about how innovative they are and how stupid and dumb traditional publishing is. And any company that does that is probably not being all that honest with you. It's just a lot of PR or spin, and that just makes me trust them less. So, you know, if they have all of these bold claims about being disruptive or innovative, um, to me, that's a huge turnoff. I don't like that. You shouldn't have to claim that to offer a good service. And also, I know this is kind of funny, especially if you're an author, um, but companies that claim to be author first or author friendly, that also, to me, raises questions about why are they trying so hard to be your friend? Um, traditional publishers, I think, are probably pretty well known at this point as being a little cold and standoffish and maybe not entirely author welcoming. You know, they're trying to dissuade you in some cases from submitting. So if the company is just kind of lavishly praising you and offering you flattery, uh, this is usually not a good sign. So if you dig into the Atmosphere Press website, um, you'll see the page that really rankles me the most, which is where they talk about how, you know, they are the best of all worlds when they put traditional publishing on the left, you know, as being kind of bad. And then they put self-publishing on the right as being kind of bad. And then they put themselves in the middle as having the best of everything. And to me, this is just um, uh, not, being not making a very good faith argument and not targeting people who would actually benefit from their services. Um, it's trying to scoop everyone up regardless of what they're interested in. So I don't like them. It doesn't necessarily mean there is scam, but it's not the sort of company I would want to work with because I can't trust that they're going to be honest with me about what they can accomplish. I see Pat's asking about BookBaby. BookBaby is a longstanding publishing services company. They offer offer all sorts of way all, all sorts of help uh, as far as the self publishing, whether it's um, book production like design and editorial work. They also offer distribution, so they're a fine company. But whether you should use them or not, it comes down to uh, your own needs, your own budget. 
I do have a resources list that I send to people upon request. You have to email me for it. Um, so I'll put that email address into the chat. It's courses at janefriedman.com. Uh, just request my resource list. If you want to see the publishing service companies in particular, I recommend. It's not exhaustive, okay? It's just a, it's a, it's a handful of companies that I know um, that I trust to do good work uh, divided by budget category. It doesn't mean these are the only companies that are okay to work with. Um, so keep that in mind as you look at that if you request it. Um, Deb is saying or uh, asking if she writes press is good. I've heard uh, both very happy authors who use them and very disappointed authors who use them. And this is another case where I'm going to pull out an article I wrote <laughs> about hybrid publishers because it is a really, really torturous thing to try and evaluate these companies. And I, I, I do feel for the authors who are in uh, this situation trying to evaluate and decide. Um, so I just put the link in the chat if you want a very long discussion about evaluating hybrid publishers. Um, and I would include paid publishing services in that. Again, I don't really differentiate much, if at all, between hybrid and paid publishing services. Okay, so if you're still not sure about the company um, and you know if it's a kind of an outright bad actor, you can use Google, you put in the name of the company or publisher you're considering, and then you type the word scam and you see what comes up. Um, and as I mentioned, once you get into the hybrid space, there are really strong opinions on both sides about what hybrids offer. So it's, it's hard to navigate. Um, but if it's a traditional publisher posing, uh, a, a company posing as a traditional publisher, and they're really not, you're going to find out very quickly that's the case. And I noticed Karen mentions in the chat she's seen a finished picture book from Book Baby, and it was far from professional. I wouldn't use them. I think there was someone in the Q and A who mentioned Book Baby's legit. So this is this is what happens because you have such a kaleidoscope of experiences with some of these publishing service companies. They can do some projects beautifully. Um, and then other projects can be really bad. And sometimes it's in fact the author's fault that the book came out really bad because the author has final say. Remember when you're, when you're doing hybrid publishing or self-publishing, the author calls most if not all of the shots. So sometimes it can be unfair to blame the company for doing what the author wanted. Okay, so to wrap up this discussion, I just want to mention what I consider a really heartbreaking case that I just ran across this past week. Um, if you know uh, Piper Kerman, uh, the Orange is the New Black author, her husband, Larry Smith, is, he runs um, uh, an initiative called Six Word Memoir. And I follow him on Facebook and I see his posts all the time. And I saw that he's doing this webinar series called Six Secrets to Self-Publishing, and he has partnered with a company known as Author Solutions, which I wish so badly this were not the case because it's lending more legitimacy to a company that I think really is predatory uh, when it comes to author services. They just sell really overpriced packages. I don't think they necessarily deliver on what they promise. Um, they have really hard sales tactics. And so this is another problem that you run into with some of these really big service firms like Author Solutions. They have lots of different brands. They have lots of different partnerships, like they have partnerships with Simon & Schuster. Um, they have partnerships with Thomas Nelson um, at once upon a time with Writer's Digest. And so this gives the veneer of respectability. Um, and now we have a really well-known person in the author community partnering with them. And it makes it sound like, oh, author solutions must not be that bad. Um, but if you do even the smallest bit of research, you're gonna find countless posts from Victoria Strauss at Writer Beware talking about the problems um, at Author Solutions and its many uh, brands, as well as David Gogren, who has written extensively about the shenanigans that they run. So this is another reason why it's really hard to say, well, 
so-and-so big name or so-and-so big company works with them, they must not be that bad. Um, you should only trust yourself <laughs> and your own criteria um, and make sure that you're always looking at doing your research. And I, again, Victoria Strauss at Writer Beware is kind of the gold standard here. Um, if the company is done wrong and they deserve uh, to be their feet held to the fire for it, she is going to do it. Um, so always be sure to check out her site. Oh, Debbie says the blurb says author house, not author solutions. It's the same company. So author solutions has um, author house, iUniverse, Ex Libris, Westbow, Archway. Uh, you know, I could go on for another minute with all of the brands that they run. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about agents. Fortunately, this is an area where there's not as much outright scammy activity, but you can end up with an agent that maybe isn't the best. Um, so generally you want an agent who has a track record of sales to publishers that fit your work. If they're a new agent, they're not going to have the track record. So I would be looking at, are they with an established agency? Uh, do they have previous industry experience? And generally you can be somewhat assured of their legitimacy if they're either a member of the AALA, that's the Professional Organization for Agents, or if their terms are pretty straightforward, which is they only get paid when you get paid. So most agents are gonna take 15% of whatever you make. And so you wouldn't be paying them upfront. That means the biggest red flag with agents is that they're gonna charge you fees. It's just not a standard. It's very unusual for that to happen. If they have this overwhelming focus on trying to sell you services or publishing packages, which is bizarre, um, but some do, that to me, not a great sign because they should be making their money off selling your book. And then finally, if they don't appear to be making print deals with traditional book publishers, that's also an issue. Um, and the reason I mentioned that is you can find some agents who are making a lot of deals and you'll find their deals in publishers marketplace, which I'll mention here in another second, um, but they're digital only deals or they're deals with hybrid publishers or they're deals with tiny presses you could have approached yourself. So it's really important to look at the composition of the deals and where their focus seems to be. And if that focus really aligns with what you intend for your own book. Now there's a term called schmagent, uh, a delightful word uh, to refer to agents who, no, <laughs> they're not really serving as a literary agent. Uh, they're the most likely to contact you totally out of the blue. It makes you wonder how they heard of you. Um, now it's true that agents do contact authors proactively, but there's always a reason. Like you had an article just published in the New York Times, or you were featured on a morning show, or you had a guest appearance on a popular podcast, or you know, some you caught fire in some way, and the agent's going to mention that right up front if that's the case. Um, so if you get these any sort of contact out of the blue, it's always a red flag. Research their book deals in Publishers Marketplace, as I mentioned. It does cost you some money, $25 a month, but it's really well worth it if it's someone you're seriously considering. Um, and then you can also, as with the publishers, just run that Google search, um, run the Google search with the agent name plus the word scam to see what comes up. There's also a really good message board where people talk about some of those gray area companies, um, absolute right. Absolute Right Water Cooler is a really good place to do some of this research and talk with others about what's normal, what's not normal. Okay, I'm just going to pause here for a drink and take a look at the questions. Uh, Sally Ann asks, what about agents who are also editors and want to edit your work before they try to sell your work? So this is fairly standard. Um, in fact, there are some authors who actively seek out agents who are very hands-on, who will do that editorial work uh, to bring your 
manuscript or proposal up to the standard they think it needs needs to meet before they go on submission. In fact, it's kind of a red flag if the agent just takes your query letter and takes your proposal, doesn't change a thing, doesn't make any suggestions whatsoever, and they just kind of copy and paste it um, and send it to an editor without their own personalized message. That's, uh, that's kind of schmagent area. Um, so it's not a bad thing if an agent wants to do some work with you. What becomes a problem is if they want to charge you a lot of money up front. Um, so there are, you know, there are scenarios where that it might not be a big deal and maybe you're happy to invest that money. Maybe you kind of know in your heart of hearts uh, you needed an editor, but you just didn't, you didn't have the money or you hoped it would, the problems would be overlooked. So then you have a, hard, a very hard decision to make. Um, that said, there are plenty of agents who do that work without charging you for it. And the AALA, if the agent's a member of AALA, the ethics state that if they charge you for that sort of work and they end up representing you, they have to refund the money. So typically if the agent's representing you, they're not supposed to ask for money to do work. If they haven't offered representation, that gives them an open door to charge you, and they may or may not represent you at the end of it, and you're going to have to be okay with that. So just be really cautious in those scenarios. I'm not going to say outright that it's wrong, but most agents who are very, they keep, um, they have very clear boundaries, very clear boundaries about what they're going to do when you're a client and what they perform as a service and what you're going to have to pay them for. So look for the agents who have those super clear boundaries. I would avoid the agents that seem really mushy um, about those arrangements. Uh, Dolores is asking, what does schmagent mean? So schmagent is someone who is, they're not really an agent, but they're calling themselves one. So they don't necessarily have uh, what it takes to sell your book, or they just engage in very shady practices. All right, let's move on to contests and competitions. So I know that writers love these things, and you know it can provide accountability, motivation. It can be fun to do it with friends. But I have to tell you that most contests and competitions are profit centers, um, not necessarily in a bad way, like a lot of literary magazines and literary organizations use these as ways to prop up their nonprofit business model. And, you know, and if you want to support that literary organization or magazine, then you might not mind that you're giving them 10 or 20 bucks for your contest entry. I think the problem comes into play when you're paying to enter contests or competitions that no one has ever heard of. Um, and you can't find any like real clear person behind it. And there's no clear history of what success the winners have achieved. So it's really hard to tell you which ones are worth it because there are so many of them. But you can compare the entry fee versus the prizes. A good rule of thumb that the Authors Guild offers is 100 times the entry fee. So if the entry fee is $5, one of the top prizes ought to be $5,000. Um, and there ought to be you know, other maybe other levels of uh, like, what, what do you get if you're second or third or an honorable mention? I would stay away from the free contests where you pay to publish if you win, that's a that's a bait and switch. Very common. It goes back decades. Um, so I would avoid those. Um, and you sometimes have to be really careful with the fine print, especially on new contests. Um, strangely, from really big organizations. So sometimes a really big company will get this idea to run a writing contest for some reason, and it might be free. And all, their lawyers have come up with the terms and conditions, and it basically says somewhere in there that the company takes all rights to your entry, whether you win or not. And that is a big no-no. And usually the pattern of what happens at that point is someone lets Victoria Strauss at Writer Beware know about that unethical term. She reports it, the company is embarrassed, and they take it out of the contest rules. So make sure you read what rights the contest has to your work if you don't win and if you do win and make sure you're comfortable with how they're framing it. 
All right, moving on to marketing and promotion. You should be super skeptical of marketing packages from publishing service firms. It's not necessarily because they're trying to cheat you, but because I don't think they typically give you results that are in line with the costs. This is particularly true with author solutions companies. So that's the Author House, Ex Libris, iUniverse, Westbow, and so on, all those people. Uh, David Gogren actually rounded up some of the marketing packages and marketing services that company offers, and the prices are just insane. So like a press release, $1,300, like not even the best publicist in the world is going to charge you that much for a press release. Podcast interviews for 10 grand, um, an ad in Reader's Digest for $143,000. YouTube ads for 5,500, Hollywood pitching for 15,000. You get the idea. Um, no, you don't want any of that. Um, the other thing is even if those prices were reasonable, usually you wanna go and hire that help directly because you're gonna get a much better price. There is always an enormous markup on marketing and promotion services from these firms because they're a middleman. They're taking a cut and then farming the work out usually to someone else. If the work's done in-house, that's different and maybe you're getting a fair price. I would say that anything that helps the book be better packaged, like a better cover, uh, better positioned, better marketing description, anything like that, I think the publishing service firm is probably charging you a fair price or it's already included in the package that you're buying. So beyond that, I would just hire the expert help you need. And I have a chart coming where I'm just going to lay out where I think it's wise to invest and what sort of things I would avoid. Before I do that, though, I want to talk about the very contentious issue of paid book reviews. This is another case where I have a very extensive blog post. Uh, if someone wants to grab that link, uh, paid book reviews, are they worth it? Are they okay? And the answer as with some of these things is it, it kind of depends, but if you have to ask, probably it's not worth it. Um, long story short, if you're writing a children's book and you're self-publishing it, there might be a good reason to pay for that book review. If you are really focused on bookstore and library marketing and you have a solid plan in place for marketing to bookstores and libraries as a self-published author, maybe that paid book review will be okay. But by and large, I find that this is a waste of money and it's done more for the author's ego and their feeling of like, I don't know how to get reviews otherwise. I, I must pay to get one. Um, now, for those who aren't sure where these paid book reviews come from, I want to be clear, this is from companies like Publishers Weekly, Book Life, um, from Kirkus Indie, uh, and there are other firms that do them as well. That's just the tip of the iceberg. But we're talking here about professional, indus usually industry-facing reviews. We're not talking about paying for Amazon reviews in the customer section. We're talking about so-called professional reviews that appear in industry publications. So I, I'm not a fan. And uh, if you read the comments thread of that post that Bex just posted in the chat, thank you. You're gonna find someone pushing back against me really, really hard. And of course it's someone who runs a paid book review service. Um, so I don't think such people are bad, but I just question how wise the investment is. Now, for marketing and promotion services, I just want to do a quick what I recommend and what I don't recommend. I think it's great to do events to support your book, whether it's in person or virtual, but I think it's a waste of money to pay any service for book fair or trade show display. So that's when people solicit you to put your book on display at Frankfurt Book Fair or London Book Fair or the LA Book Festival or whatever it happens to be. Those places are not the place to market and promote your book, especially if you're a self-published author. Just if, Now, if your traditional publisher does it, they're going to pay for it. Um, but as an author, you should not pay for it. I do think niche, targeted, narrow advertising is great. You probably know the right places yourself. I would avoid any sort of national advertising campaign, like where you get your book 
mentioned in the New York Times or something. Um, I know that Author Solutions and similar companies will try to sell you that kind of advertising package. I just think it's worthless. Amazon, BookBub, Facebook ads can work and they can provide you a positive return on investment if you're willing to learn how to do it yourself. There are a handful of services out there that might be able to give you some assistance, but what I find the recurring pattern here is it's not profitable for anyone if someone's running those ad campaigns for you. The people who started out doing those as an individual for other authors, stop doing them quickly because it's really hard to sell a book through ads, especially when, when you can't control all the variables. Like you might hire someone to advertise your book on Amazon, but they might know, gosh, that cover is not going to work, or this book probably isn't going to benefit from advertising, and this is a waste of money. Um, but are they going to tell you that? Don't know. Maybe they will, and maybe they won't. So in any event, uh, selling books is usually a low profit margin activity. So once you pay the person to help you with the ads, um, you're probably not going to make a profit on the book. So it's usually a scenario where you need to learn the system yourself if you really want to see a benefit. I don't recommend most advertising, period, unless you're willing to learn yourself. Uh, there is one exception, one or two exceptions. Um, written word media does really great packages, I think, that are helpful for people who understand the offerings. Um, like they have a promo stacking offering that's very interesting. But if you don't know what promo stacking is, I wouldn't go run over there and buy it. Um, it's for people who are already kind of in the know. Uh, there's also a service by MJ Rose called Author Buzz. I'm going to type that into the chat so people know what I'm talking about. If you were doing a very industry-focused campaign, like trying to appeal to booksellers, librarians, book clubs, that might be worth it. Like she knows what she's doing and she's been in the business a long time. But generally, an advertising campaign has to be combined with other efforts in order to show results. You can't just depend on the ad to drive sales. I do believe in hiring someone to help you break into specific media outlets. Like if you did want to do a podcast tour or um, you wanted to do a, like an Instagram tour of some kind, or you wanted to reach out to TikTok influencers, I think it can really help to get someone who's familiar with that strategy to coach you or to come up with a plan and, and help you do it. But I don't think you should, uh, there are a lot of packages about blasting out press releases that I think are mainly useless. Anything that involves the word blast, I hope uh, you will stay away from. And then finally, if you have the money to hire someone to help you with marketing strategy and tactics, excellent. Um, but avoid the trendy marketing stuff. Um, like book trailers were really trendy some years ago. I still get them. I still see people try to sell them, but I don't think they're uh, effective uh, unless you have a very unusual book. Um, there's also, you know, people who will direct message you on social media and say, oh, I, you know, I'll review your book. I'm an influencer and I can get you lots of reviews. All that's just garbage. So um, the short lesson here is that you can't buy your way to success. And a lot of these services will, especially on the marketing and publicity side, will position themselves as if you pay me, um, your book will be successful or visible or sell more. And it's almost always too good to be true. So just a quick list of when to run in the other direction. If you're told to pay to get consideration in Hollywood, you know, movie, TV, because authors, they really often want to see their books you know, put on the screen. And so you, you are very good bait when, when you have that dream and someone is saying, oh, I can help you achieve that dream. If you're pitched any kind of opportunity for your self-published book from a strange service or person, they probably got your name and email scraped off Amazon or some other place. Um, and now they're calling you or emailing you and you have no idea how they got your information. It's probably because you self-published and they got it, you know, off of some database. Like I mentioned earlier, if you receive strange messages from influencers or others who will promote your book, forget it. Um, the people who can really make a difference, like the influencers on TikTok who really know what to do, they are not going to be soliciting you. They have more than they can handle already. And then 
the really sad thing that's happened in the last year or two is that there are scammers who are pretending to be famous people. So like there are people out there pretending to be famous directors, um, famous editors, famous publishers. And because people aren't paying close enough attention, they don't realize it's a scammer and not that famous entity. So watch those email addresses really carefully. Again, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Now, there are a lot of areas I didn't talk about, and one of them has to do with editing and coaching services, which my case study focuses on that, so we will talk a little bit about it. Um, but here's how to spot scams or bad deals at any time, in any place. Um, I, I hear I've got the Nutrisystem ad. This was uh, something that was so prevalent when I was growing up, these Nutrisystem ads. Um, and they always had the little, little asterisk results, not typical. <laughs> so whenever you're evaluating something, ask yourself, if they're showing you this case study or the success story, are these results typical? Um, and by all means, ask that question if you feel like you're about to buy in. Okay, so have you been solicited? Bad sign always. If you're feeling pressured, you're probably being sold. You should always research comparable services and pricing. I think it's it can be a problem if the service is too cheap. And it can also be a problem if it's too expensive. You know, there is kind of like this middle ground that where you tend to find the most legitimate services and companies. Look for time spent in the industry. I mean, it's not always going to help you because like Author Solutions has been around since the year 2000. So their longevity is not going to tell you anything uh, about the quality. But um, especially for individuals like editors and marketers and publicists and agents that can tell you a lot if they've been able to survive. I would avoid the so-called or the self-anointed disruptors and innovators. Ignore flattery because that's how they get you every single time. They really butter you up, make you feel good, make you feel special, like you're finally getting noticed. And then when in doubt, See Writer Beware. You can also email Writer Beware that goes straight to Victoria Strauss, who runs it and has for as long as I've been in the business. Great consistency there. Um, and she will respond. There are a lot of companies that she doesn't list on her site, but that she has reports on. So when I have questions about a company and I can't find any information about it anywhere, she is the first person I ask. And it should be the first, she should be the first person you ask to. Finally, don't, don't be your own worst enemy. Don't shoot yourself in the foot um, by, fall, by like being good bait. And I think authors, unfortunately, have been some of the best bait for these scams because we're often, we want the whole process to be over. Um, the process of choosing is stressful. It's really hard work to research these companies. Um, we feel vulnerable. We want it to be over. Uh, we just want to pay. We want to write a check and make the headache go away. And people just feel they, they get exhausted by everything that's coming at them or how long they've worked and still haven't made progress. So just be very self-aware when you're reaching that point and don't rush into a decision that you're going to regret later. All right, so let's do a little case study. Um, I have to thank someone in particular on Instagram, and now Renee, Renee on Instagram. I don't know if she's joining us here today, um, but she asked me in the comments when I posted about today's class, she said, have you heard of queryletter.com? I, they look legit and I'm, I think, you know, you know, I might use them, but what do you, what do you say? And I hadn't heard of this company, so I, I was curious. Um, so let's take a look. I'm going to stop the share and switch over to my browser. Just a moment. Oh, nope. Misfire. Let's try that again. There we go. All right. So everyone should now see my browser uh, with the queryletter.com site. Now, something that happened as soon as I loaded this site is I got a pop up. Uh, to join the email newsletter list. And I also got a pop-up here in the right-hand corner um, to chat with their publishing consultant. Uh, the pop-up, like the email newsletter pop-up doesn't really bother me. Um, this whole 
automated chat thing always rubs me the wrong way, but maybe you're different. Maybe that has worked out well for you in the past. It has not worked out well for me. So I always hate that. Uh, so that does, does not incline me well to queryletter.com, but I want to be fair. So the first question I have is, who's behind it? If someone's going to help me with a query letter, I want to know how long they've been in the industry, um, in what sort of position they've had the opportunity to see query letters, to know what's effective. Um, have they been an editor, an agent, a publicist, like some sort of credentials? I'm looking for credentials. Um, they say, we leverage years of industry experience. Our team prepares full query letter packages to make life easy. Uh, music to authors' ears, make life easy. Um, but they don't say, it's all very vague, isn't it? Like, who are we talking about here? They've got some uh, testimonials. That's good. They like, I see some real names on the testimonials, but still, who, who, who is it? Uh, so I'm going to go to more. Ah, here we have about us. Our small company educates authors. Here's what we offer. Who are we? The team is made up of publishing industry professionals. Some of us have worked at literary agencies, others at publishing houses, others are authors. Okay, fine. But who? <laughs> like, can you at least tell me like who the founder owner is? Like who's the main proprietor? They don't say. And on this criteria alone, I would abandon them. Like I can name for you right now, probably four or five people who have great credentials, who are willing to identify themselves and stand behind their work that will be more than happy to help you with your query letter. Um, just to name one off the top of my head, Courtney Mom, who is the author of Before and After the Book Deal. She has a query letter service package. I think it's maybe $700, which sounds like a lot, but hang on. Um, if we look at all the services, we go to a new page and we see query letter package. They're actually charging quite a bit. Oh, here's that pop up again. Um, now, I don't think this is so expensive that it's foolish to take advantage of at these prices, but it's the sort of price I would expect to pay if I knew who I was working with. Like, I think individuals can command these prices, individuals who have, you know, the industry expertise I can see and trust for myself. But do I want to pay a nameless person this amount of money? And I don't want to wait like to find out who I'm working with after I've paid the money, if that's the case. Um, there's also some of these really crazy priced packages, which that is another red flag. I mean, $22,000 for a publishing package? Um, no, not from this company anyway, maybe some other company. So. There are a lot of problems here. Um, and once you start digging a little bit further, um, I just don't find anything that would change my mind. Now, it could be that they will do a decent job editing your query, and maybe they would do a de decent job writing your query from scratch. Maybe. I don't know. But I wouldn't risk it. And a lot of what this is about, today's session is about, is sometimes the bad actors they might do okay work some of the time, but do you want to roll the dice? Do you want to be the one who paid the money and didn't get what you were hoping for? Um, it reminds me of a personal decision I had to make recently. Um, I was shopping for a treadmill. And if you try shopping for a treadmill, you're going to notice the two top results almost every time, wherever you look, are Nordic Track and Peloton. And I was all sold on one of those two until I started reading more deeply into the customer service, the longevity of the machines. And then I realized I was about to be taken. <laughs> I don't want to be one of those people who rolls the dice and sees if the treadmill actually operates after six months. Um, so I made a different choice. Now, maybe the Nordic track worked out fine for those thousands of people who bought it, but there are also lots of people who are extremely unhappy with the customer service. Okay, so pardon me for taking that little, um, uh, doing that little analogy detour. So I don't particularly like this company, um, but I don't have any hard evidence to say, oh yeah, they're, they're a scam. I think they're gonna do the work. I just question 
if you know if um, if it's going to be the best work you could get at that price. All right, so I'm going to stop the share, and we've got some time for questions. Just a moment. Okay, so I'm in the Q and A box. I know there's some uh, stuff in the chat, but I'll focus on the Q and A for now. Uh, Nancy mentions LA Weekly. $600 Mogul Press will include a short paragraph about me and my success story. Lots of people I know got this one. I haven't heard about this, but I am always skeptical of any time you pay for coverage. Um, if you want like what I would consider meaningful media attention, you're not gonna pay for it. Um, although I do it like I'm not naive. I realize people are paying for coverage all the time in, in indirect ways as well as direct ways. But I think for the average author, for the audience here with me today, this is not an opportunity I would pay for. Uh, Eva asks, what's your opinion of sending my manuscript to Word to Kindle for formatting my book to Amazon? I'm not familiar with that service, Eva, but there are lots of free services that will do it for you. Um, so like draft to digital automatically converts Word documents into EPUB or into a file that works with Amazon. Amazon itself will convert your file. I mean, I'm not going to say the results will be pretty, but it can do it. Uh, Publish Drive is an ebook distributor that also has a Word to ebook converter that's at no charge to you. So I would be more inclined to make use of one of the established companies that people have a lot of trust and respect in. Um, maybe Word to Kindle is fine. I just haven't heard of them. Um, but you always have to wonder, you know, about some companies, um, what are they doing with the manuscript that you're uploading to them? Are they deleting it right away? Um, are they using it to train AI? <laughs> it's like, or maybe you're paying the service. I don't know. Um, if you would like to hire a company to help you with your ebook formatting, there's a company called ebook partnership that I often recommend. They take on more difficult jobs. Um, so I'll put them into the chat. All right. Uh, Kathy says, as a book coach, how can I avoid coming across as suspect, um, like in ads, uh, that I'm that I'm not a predator? I think transparency is super helpful. Having a website where people can calmly and rationally evaluate your offerings. Um, so I hope you do have a website that it's you know under your name or a brand name that's consistent. Um, that you have a picture of yourself, a lengthy bio, your credentials, how long you've been in business, hopefully testimonials from happy clients. Um, if you have any particular credentials or certifications, like Author Accelerator is a common um, coach uh, credentialing service. You don't need one, but like if you have something like that, obviously put it on your site. Um, and then you can start just being active in the writing and publishing community, showing that you're here to help and to serve and you're not just here to take people's money. So I think another actual red flag about the queryletter.com service that we just looked at is that they're not active in the writing community as far as I know. Like I've never seen them attend a conference or um, you know, comment on social media or be visible in any way. So as soon as you become a person who's engaging in a friendly, helpful manner, whether, whether it's on social media or at conferences, it helps so much because it just gives people an opportunity to see you in action and develop that trust. Robin says, I heard if you publish with Amazon, the bookstores won't take your book, but Ingram does. Uh, is that correct? Um, if you publish with Amazon, it's not a deal breaker for having bookstores carry you, but there is something like if you publish your book through Amazon KDP, they have a expanded distribution option, and I think this involves taking their ISBN number. In any event, if you go in with them whole hog and have them do your book distribution to the wider world outside of Amazon, that's the deal breaker. It's not the fact that your book uh, not the fact that your your book's on Amazon. It's not the fact that you're using Amazon KDP. It's that you're only selling the book through Amazon's distribution services. So you can use Amazon and Ingram in conjunction and have the best of both worlds. Uh, Faith asks, what are reasonable rights to give for contests? Uh, generally, you should keep all of your rights if you don't win. And if you do win, then part of the winnings may in fact be we're going to publish your piece in X place. So just make sure that you're comfortable 
that if you win, if that happens, you're going to be okay with that. And usually if that is the case, like uh, a winning prize is publication, they normally will give you some idea of what rights they take. Like there'll be maybe even a sample contract or they'll say, you know, we take, uh, we pay you this much and it's exclusive or it's not exclusive. Once you reach that level, you know, it's really context dependent. Um, you know, if we're talking about a book, a story, a poem, if it's a sort of publication where you'd feel comfortable um, giving them exclusive rights or not. So there's not one right answer to that, but just make sure you get as much information as you can so that you can make that informed decision. It also helps if, um, if you change, like if that you're not locked in, if you win, that you're not locked into a bad contract. And sometimes that's a really, that's the rub. You know, you have to agree to very set terms. Um, I think this is the case with some first book contests run by a big five. I can't remember which one it is, but I think it locks you into like a $10,000 advance and a certain type of contract. And I'm not saying it's a bad contract, but now you can't have an agent come in and, you know, negotiate something better for you. So just, again, make sure you're making an informed choice and you're going to be comfortable uh, if you do win and get that opportunity. All right. Um, Marjorie's asking what I think of Page. It's a company I've heard of, but I haven't really taken a close look at. Um, but, you know, I have this I have this unfair association of them with a company that's maybe not the best, um, but I don't know why that is. It might be that they ended up in some sort of lawsuit. Some of these companies do end up in lawsuits or they close and they open again. So I have that kind of feeling surrounding them, but that could be incorrect, but be cautious. Um, you know, ask all those questions that you need to ask to feel comfortable um, and make sure that you comparison shop. I think that's the number one rule I would apply is that if you have only looked at Page and you have looked at no one else, always, 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 when you're paying for publishing services, compare three or four if you can, because they are so different from one another, so different in what they can offer. Uh, Jim asks, what do I think about publishing on Substack? Um, they seem to be working hard to be the author's friend. Um, yes, they are. They're working very hard. Um, they're working too hard, in my opinion. I, I always distrust anyone who's a little too happy-go-lucky, unicorns and rainbows, because it's a hard business, and there's no one who has the magic key. So I think they're a fine email newsletter provider. And I, in fact, you know, I, I recommend them for people just starting out, um, but they're not profitable yet. So you always have to keep that in mind. It's a, it's a shifting sands situation where, you know, if the people who fund them decide they're not going to fund them anymore, or now they have to change their business model in order to become profitable, usually that the worst effects of that fall on the users of the system. Um, so if any of you remember Medium, uh, which has been going for about 10 years now, you know, they had all sorts of business pivots that really hurt some significant publications who had moved to Medium thinking, oh, they're going to take care of all of our problems for us. Spoiler alert, they did not take care of all the problems. <laughs> so these use the services for your own ends. End of story. Okay. Sally asks, should blurbs on your book cover be given freely? I would think so, but yes, they should be given freely. You're not supposed to pay for people to blurb your book. Uh, so the little quotes of praise, those are, it's a, like a colleague to colleague sort of thing. Excuse me, scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Now it is sometimes the case that you'll be asked to pay an honorarium or some sort of fee uh, for a foreword or an introduction from a big name author. So for instance, when I worked for a traditional publisher, it wasn't uncommon for us to pay like 500 bucks um, for a big name author to write a foreword to a book. Um, that's up to you, whether you wanna do that or not. Sometimes those are given for free. So it's just, uh, it's, it's variable. Uh, Jennifer asks if I can provide a range of pricing that makes sense for a customized marketing strategy. Um, it's going to depend if it's something that they're handing you a plan and then you execute it yourself, which is going to be cheaper, 
or if they're actually in the trenches with you executing on that plan, uh, which you know it's common for a marketer or publicist to charge three to five thousand dollars per month on retainer for a full scale marketing campaign. It's a lot of money, but you can hire a marketer or a publicist to do a single task that has a definitive start, middle, and end, like let's say a podcast tour in the month of August. Um, and so that's where you can get really cost-effective help is when you focus in on what you really want to achieve and how they're going to help you achieve it. Uh, but I've seen, you know, meaningful marketing and promotion help in the hundreds of dollars when it's that really narrow or they're just helping you brainstorm. Um, but generally, if you want them working on your book promotion over a series of weeks and months, you're probably looking at the five figures. Anonymous is asking if I'd advise reserving the domain name of your book, uh, followed by the word scam to protect it from possible scams. I haven't heard that idea before. I don't think it's necessary. Um, I mean, I do think it's not a bad idea to reserve a domain name for your book that's like close to the title, just, just to squat on it so no one else takes it. Um, but I don't think it's necessary to do anything else. Uh, Kelly asks, is Book a Tour or other publishers who do not uh, do print runs, are they worth looking at or should authors run the other way? Uh, Book a Tour is like one of the best in class for a digital only publisher. They're owned by a big five company, Hachette. Um, so I, I think they do excellent work. I have no problems with Book a Tour. Um, but of course, the, one of the issues for authors who are assessing these companies is that you can see a big success story like Book a Tour, but you know they're kind of an outlier. You know they're not um, not every digital only publisher is going to have that kind of success. So if you're looking at a digital only deal, you really have to get into the weeds of who are their authors. Um, do they look like me? Does this company have strengths in my genre or subgenre? Um, am I a good match for what it seems like they're able to do? Because usually a digital only company is specializing in a particular category. And so they're going through the same playbook for each, each time because they really know the cozy mystery audience or they really know um, the clean romance category. And so they repeat the formula and maybe they also have an email newsletter list that they can market to. So just get a really good idea of their marketing plans or assets. And if they're going to be earning their share of uh, of uh, the sales. Usually it's a 50-50 deal uh, with publishers like that where you 50-50 on, on the ebook sales. Rose asks if I've heard of Get a Book Deal 101. Uh, I'm afraid I haven't, but don't take that as meaning anything. Anita says, if you fall victim to one of these companies, is your work protected? Can someone take your manuscript and publish under their name? Um, you still are protected under copyright, so that never goes away. Usually the biggest harm is money lost. You've just written a check and you can't get your money back if you want to back out. Like if you find out later, oh my God, I've made a terrible mistake. Usually once you've paid your fees, that's it. Um, you might be able to stop publication, um, but it's really hard to get a refund. So this is one reason why it's really helpful when you do hire a service. If you're the least bit concerned, try to make the payouts in installments. Don't pay it all up front. And anyone who got caught in the scribe scandal um, over the last few months, they're feeling that really acutely right now because a lot of those people paid the full amount up front. We're talking about tens of thousands of dollars and they're probably not going to get that money back. So I think that's where the fear should lie. It should, I don't think anyone's, no one's really interested in doing what you're describing, Anita, um, because it's so hard to make money on book sales. It's much easier to take your money, Anita, than to earn it on the sale of your book. I'm sorry to say. As Susan says, how do I feel about the Independent Book Publishers Association? They promote a lot of services you are recommending against. So this is a really tough case. And I was anticipating someone might ask this, in fact. And Susan, I'm glad you did. Um, so Independent Book Publishers Association is a legit, valuable organization. But they serve two different constituencies. They serve self-publishing authors. And then they serve small publishers including hybrid publishers. So you can see how this can create some conflict. Um, 
I want to say two things about this, and then you're going to have to make your own decision. One is they do not vet who calls themselves a hybrid publisher. So if you see a hybrid publisher who's an IBPA member, they are not vetting them to see if they abide by the standards that the IBPA itself has set out. Like you should meet these criteria to call yourself a hybrid. They will take anyone who pays the membership fee and they don't really investigate unless someone reports a problem. So that's an issue. Um, the second thing I'll say is that I think some of their marketing services that involve like trade show appearances, uh, trade advertising, like advertising in Publishers Weekly, et cetera, that can be valuable if you're a small publisher and you know what you're doing. I don't know how much sense it makes for the average self-publishing author. So I hope that helps. Uh, Daniel asks, ads in genre-specific magazines, are those okay? They, they could be. Um, I think a lot here depends on the cost. Um, and, you know, it, it helps if you can test these things in a cost-efficient way. So usually I say, you know, before you run a print ad, can you run an email newsletter ad? You know, are there lower commitments before you spend big? Uh, Robert says, I mentioned a professional editor named Courtney for creating query letters. Yes, that was uh, Courtney mom. I'm going to put her name into the chat. You can easily find her at CourtneyMom.com. Uh, Karen says, back to self-publishing services, wouldn't a service want to have some kind of professionalism and let the authors know that the books they publish need to adhere to some guidelines? <laughs> um, yes, and they try. But usually the authors have veto power because they're the ones paying the bills. So, you know, it's that's just how it is. There's the way we wish things were and the way they actually play out. And it's usually to the author's detriment. But, you know, they want the book that they want. Uh, someone's mentioning that Lemon Jelly Press, like two pitches of mine in a recent Twitter pitch event, I looked at their website, they look new. They do not check all the boxes I shared. Does them participating in a pitch event make them more legit or not necessary? So there is actually some pretty well-known scams that are run based on Twitter pitch events. And I'm glad to the person who asked this question because it's one area I didn't touch on. Um, for those of you who are like, ooh, what are these Twitter pitch events? I would say, don't bother <laughs> at this point uh, for a range of reasons. But if you wanna participate, fine but it is where scammers lurk. So it's, it's well known that some of these scammers will like your tweets, your pitches, and then you'll go to submit or whatever you do after the Twitter pitch event. And if you don't let, take a careful look at their site, um, you might not realize, you know, this is a garbage publisher and I'm not even sure they are a publisher. So whoever asked that question, I would probably stay far away and I'm sure that, um, again, Victoria Strauss, she probably has a whole post on this. So go to Writer Beware and type in Twitter pitch event into the search box uh, to see what she said lately about this. But you do have to be super careful when you're talking about your book in public that way, because it does leave the door open for scammers to approach you because they know you're a hot target. Uh, Patty asks, if you win a book contest, do you generally keep ancillary rights, like adapting the book to a movie? Not necessarily. So again, read the fine print. I think Huffington Post um, ran a contest, this has been many years ago, where they basically kept every imaginable right, like everything from the movie rights, TV rights, merchandise rights, theme park rights, like all of it. Um, and you have to ask, really, <laughs> is, that, is that being fair? Um, so be, again, be cautious when looking at those contests, especially if it's for a book. I think that's where the real danger lies. Uh, Robin asks, what do you think about submitting a chapter from your memoir for publication? Does that impact future work with an agent? Nope, not at all. Janet says, I'm finding more articles at Writer Beware than the list of presses and their evaluations. Help. Um, I think what I would do, Janet, this is what I do. Um, rather than go to Writer Beware directly, if there's a very specific 
press I'm interested in, I will go to Google, type in writer beware and put it in quotes and then add the name of the company that I'm interested in. That's how I generally use it. They're not really a database of publishers. They don't give thumbs up, thumbs down rankings to every publisher or every agent. So you can't expect to use it in that way. Although they do keep a list of, I think a consistent list of vanity presses. I do think they keep a consistent list of thumbs up, thumbs down agents. Um, so they have a few key areas like that, but by and large, I just do the Google search. Michelle asks, what recourse do you have if you find yourself scammed? Do you involve the police? Uh, what suggestions do I have? Well, step one is contact Victoria Strauss. I know I sound like a broken record, but um, it's super helpful. I think because she spreads information around to other authors, you're going to help save other people the same loss or heartache. So we need to speak up when these things happen, and she's a safe place to go. Um, she's not going to mention your name. You're not going to have to deal with any repercussions, um, like if the company wants to come after you because you said something. Um, so report it to her. If there are enough people who've been harmed, sometimes the Authors Guild will get involved. So you may also want to report it to the Authors Guild proactively, whether or not you're a member. And I should say that Writer Beware and Authors Guild do talk to one another. So when they're seeing large scale harm, and large scale can be like 10 people, um, they tend to take action and they try to do things that would get the company to, if they want to stay in business, make things right. So, you know, make sure that you let writers associations know if you're part of any if it's especially if it's related a scam related to your genre um, or let authors guild and writer beware know um, the other thing you can do is report them to the better business bureau um, i don't know how effective that's going to be but you can try um, and in some cases you might be able to go to like a small claims court um, but you know some of these options are more trouble uh, than they're worth. So I guess it would depend on the magnitude of the loss you've experienced and how angry you are. Um, but I would definitely look for people who are in the same boat as you, because that will also help you get satisfaction. Uh, Maria says, have you heard of problems with sites that have virtual author assistance for hire? Um, no, I haven't heard anything like that, but it doesn't mean there aren't problems. So um, I'm not sure what problems you might be referring to, Maria. But again, whenever I think of hiring virtual people to help me with anything, I always think of, I want to see their name. I want to see their photo. I want to know how long they've been in business. Um, I want to know who else they've worked with. Um, I really don't like middlemen if I can avoid it. So, because middlemen tend to hide what's happening. So to me, you know, queryletter.com, which we looked at, that to me looks like a middleman service where they're hiring really uh, cheap graduate student labor and then pocketing half the fee and then giving the other half to the graduate student. Um, so just keep that in mind because when you have those middlemen, it, it inflates your cost and you might not be getting the best possible help. Uh, Liz says Canadian books, uh, Canadian bookstores requesting $149 to display uh, a book uh, with a direct link to Amazon for interested buyers. Is this legit? I have heard of situations like this for self-published authors, where some independent bookstores will take a fee for display. Um, it's hard for me to say whether this is right or wrong. It's very contextual. And of course, traditional publishers pay for placement too. So I don't think it's out of bounds for them to ask for an author to pay for placement. So you just have to decide, is this an opportunity that you think will be a stepping stone to something else? Uh, I don't know, May maybe. Um, I will tell you there's one service I really don't like um, that's unfortunately offered by Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, DC, which is a great bookstore. Like I have no problem with the bookstore. But they offer publishing package services that they're not overpriced. I think the pricing is fine, but I think a lot of people expect great things to happen when politics and prose publishes their book, um, like having a link on their website uh, to the book or something like that. And it just, I don't think it makes a 
bit of difference. Um, although I have heard of happy authors using their services. So, you know, just realize the stores are trying to stay um, profitable. They're trying to earn money however they can. And sometimes these sorts of um, enticements, um, they can help everyone, but just be eyes wide open about what you think this is going to do for you. 60% plus of books today are sold online. They're not sold in a bookstore, but if this is really your market and you also want to support this bookstore, um, 149, I guess, isn't too much out of pocket, depending on your budget. All right. So I'm going to do this screen share again, just briefly here to talk to you about the next uh, session coming up, the next clinic. This is August 22nd. I'm going to be in conversation with Lorraine Norwood talking about how she is too nice and is getting trampled by her clients. So this is a reversal of today's session, in other words. So sometimes clients do behave badly and they take advantage of the service provider. Um, so we'll talk about if you are in that position yourself as a service provider, how can you say no without, um, without hurting any feelings or getting fired? So I'll stop the share there. And uh, thank you all for coming today. You had some wonderful questions and I hope this has been useful in steering you away from the bad actors, from the bad deals, and definitely from the outright scams. You should be well prepared now to spot the really egregious ones. And um, I would say, come to me if you have questions about any company I didn't mention, but the real person to go to, say it after me, is writer beware. <laughs> so have their email address in your back pocket. Thanks, everyone. Have a terrific day and hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.